So you started an exercise program, or maybe you work out on a regular basis, and then all of a sudden, a sports injury stops you in your place. This week on Being Well, our guest, Dr. Todd Garner from the medical staff at Eastern Illinois University Health Service will be here to talk about the prevention and treatment of common sports injuries. Don't go away, Being Well starts right now. Well, Dr. Todd Gardner, thank you so much for coming on Being Well. I should say that you are, you work for health service here at Eastern, but you also, you're, what's your primary area over at the health service? Uh, primarily sports medicine. Okay. In addition to providing care for the, the general students, I provide care for our 450 athletes. So you're busy. Yes. So when we yes. wanted to do something on sports injuries, you're our guy, because you man. see a lot of it. Now you see a lot of it in 20 year olds. We're gonna talk more about sports injuries for adults, people our age, as we get older, you know, there's some things that can happen. So my first question is, what are the most common sports injuries that in, in for adults that you see? By far the most common thing I see, Lori, are muscular strains, ligamentous sprains, and overuse type injuries such as tendonitis. Okay, well, I mean, we've all probably experienced that enough. So. What causes some of that muscle pain and stiffness after, you know, maybe you haven't worked out for a while and you go work out and the next day you're just, you just can't really get out of bed very fast. What's kind of the underlying cause of that? And there's something we, we call DOMS, delayed <laughs> onset muscular soreness. And while it's somewhat controversial, we believe that's a result of micro trauma. Okay. Where essentially if you were to look at your muscles underneath a microscope, you would see microscopic tearing of the mm -hmm. muscle fibers. And, but you need that tearing though to build muscle, to, to build the muscle and make it stronger. That's correct. Okay, so do we know why sometimes, you know, you may do your workout and you're like, I feel pretty good this next day, and then it's day two, it's a little worse. Do we know why? No, we really <laughs> don't know why that so occurs, but, um, but it, does. it certainly does. Okay, so if you've got some of that you know, delayed onset muscle soreness, what, what treatment do you recommend for people? Uh, particularly during the first 48 hours, I typically recommend uh, ice mm -hmm. um, rather than heat. While heat is far more soothing for most of us, ice works better to take down swelling mm -hmm. and inflammation. And it also has an anesthetic effect where it numbs the nerves. Okay. Um, there's a mnemonic we use called RICE, uh, rest for R for rest, mm -hmm. I for ice, C for compression, such as an ACE wrap, mm -hmm. uh, and E for elevation. Okay. I tell my patients, uh, uh, if it's a lower extremity injury, get the toes up above the nose. And why does that help, that elevation? Does it have to do with blood flow? Uh, it helps to prevent uh, swelling so okay. that the blood flow can get to that area. Okay, this is always a question I have. I can never remember what's better to take if you've got that muscle soreness and you're having a hard time maybe getting out of the car up the steps. Is it better to take um, a pain reliever or an anti-inflammatory or both? You know, oftentimes anti-inflammatories are superior in that they actually work for the inflammatory part of the condition. Mm -hmm. They help take down swelling and inflammation whereas the acetaminophen, Tylenol type products work mm -hmm. for pain, but not so much for the inflammation. Okay, and which one of those is, should you be concerned about if you have maybe, um, you're on blood thinners or you may have liver issues? Yes, uh, that being said, you have to be cautious with Tylenol, the acetaminophen, if you have liver issues, mm -hmm. because that's metabolized by the liver. Mm -hmm. The anti-inflammatories such as ibuprofen and naproxen, mm -hmm. Those need to be used judiciously in those with um, uh, heart problems that are on blood thinners, um, or those with ulcer problems, or those with um, end-stage renal disease that have kidney problems mm -hmm. and uh, are on dialysis. So you gotta be careful about how much you take, and yes. just because it's over the counter doesn't mean you can take as much as you want. Exactly, <laughs> all of these medications which are now available over the counter um, were once available only by prescription. Mm -hmm. So can you take them in combination or will they cancel each other out? Yes, because of differing uh, amounts of uh, different ways in which they are excreted, uh, you can take uh, the acetaminophen or Tylenol along with, say, ibuprofen. Okay. 
Okay, that's good to know. All right, we're going to talk about some random kind of sports injury ailments. First of all, what is the difference between a strain and a sprain? <laughs> a strain is a problem with the muscle. You okay. strain a muscle or as you sprain a ligament. Okay. And the, uh, the ligaments are what connect the bones to the bones. Mm -hmm. Um, and the muscles and tendons which attach to the bones. Okay, so that's the sprain is a little more severe. Correct. And how do you know if you have one versus the other? <laughs> um, well, they're frequently treated about the same. Um, usually the physician or your physical therapist or your athletic trainer can examine your joint uh, and determine if there's any ligamentous laxity. Okay. And if it's a little loose at uh, one of your joints, that would suggest that it's a ligamentous type problem. Okay, and I, I sprained my ankle when I was a kid and you get a lot of swelling with a sprain sure. versus sure. just a strain. Sure. Okay, so let's move on to another one, tendonitis. Okay, <laughs> that's essentially overuse or inflammation of a tendon. Okay. And again, tendons are where the muscles connect to the bones. Okay, so where are the typical areas where people get tendonitis at? You know, I see a lot of uh, tennis elbow, mm -hmm. uh, or what we call lateral epicondylitis. I see some golfer's elbow, or what we see uh, called medial epicondylitis, mm -hmm. about the inner aspect of the elbow. We see a lot of uh, rotator cuff tendonitis of the mm -hmm. shoulder, patellar tendonitis uh, of the knee. Okay, so what, what are kind of some of the symptoms um, you don't know, maybe you just strain your muscle. How do you know if it's tendonitis? Does it have a different feeling or is the pain more severe? Uh, typically with tendonitis, the pain is, is uh, severe uh, and it tends to linger on longer. Okay. Our muscles have an excellent blood supply, whereas the tendons have a very poor supply. Mm -hmm. And that's why it takes so much longer for tendonitis or ligamentous sprain to resolve. Okay, so what kind of treatment if you have tendonitis? Is it just rest or what do you do for it? Uh, rest, ice, elevation, uh, compression. We have all sorts of different uh, braces that we use depending on which body part it is that's mm -hmm. affected. The anti-inflammatory medicines, physical therapy, um, some you know, like sports massage, chiropractic adjustments. Mm -hmm. um, there are any of a number of ways to treat these problems. Okay, well, let's talk about some injuries that I think are more associated with running. And I'm gonna talk about one because I have it, is IT band syndrome. Um, what, where is, it's the, I'll, what does IT stand for? IT stands for iliotibial band syndrome. And the iliotibial band is something that's important in stabilizing the lateral aspect of the knee okay. uh, from when you move to the side. And basically, it attaches up at your hip. Way at your high hip. Up high mm -hmm. on the ASIS, we call it, and comes down to the side of the leg just below the knee. Okay. And so why, why is that something that runners seem to have issues with it um, more than other know, sports? It, it can have to do with conditioning, uh, being a little uh, deconditioned before you start your mm -hmm. training. Uh, commonly, if you think about it, most of the roads are a little bit slanted and most of us tend to ride, run along the right side of the road in this right. country. And that puts undue stress about the lateral aspect of the leg. Mm -hmm. uh, in our track athletes, if they continually run in the same direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, I should say, around the track, that can be problematic. It's sometimes good to alternate mm -hmm. clockwise and counterclockwise how you run around the track. Okay. Um, uh, so it's primarily uh, how you're you're striking the pavement, and if you're striking at an un, on level, uh, that puts you at higher risk for that. Okay. Uh, some of us also pronate and and can benefit from orthotic devices in mm -hmm. our shoes to build up the the side of the foot so that we don't turn our foot in. Okay. When we run. Now I know what uh, an irritated IT band feels like, but why don't you describe what that? what that feeling is like so people know that oh it's not their hip joint it's it's really the IT band. Um, basically um, it will go from the hip and if you poke along your leg you can usually feel it all the way down to the side of the leg just mm -hmm. below the knee as I described mm -hmm. and there are a number of different exercises that we do for stretching. 
mm -hmm. uh, to help to prevent that and for strengthening. But uh, again, it's one of those injuries that tends to linger on far longer than what we would like. <laughs> yeah, so look for that flat surface to run on. Um, you can look up online, that's how I did for the different stretches for IT band. It, does sure. ice or anything help? Yes, like again, that? ice works quite well. Okay. Um, my wife is a marathon runner okay. and she has this new foam oh, roller. Oh, the rollers, I love that, the roller. That she just loves, mm -hmm. so. Um, that, that, you know, and someone said, well, Lori, why don't you just quit running? That seems like the obvious question, but. Right, if it hurts, don't do it. I right. know, but it's hard when you really enjoy something. It's, sure hard it to, it's hard to let it go. Let's talk about another one, stress fractures. I've, I've had one of those. See, this is a good show because I've had a bunch of this stuff. <laughs> stress fractures, I've had a stress fracture in my foot. Yes. Is, that a, is, your, is that really a broken bone or what is it? Yes, it's a, uh, a broken bone. Uh, typically, we don't see the severity and frequently these will heal much quicker than a, a regular fracture. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes the outer portion of the bone, the periosteum, will just buckle up and be a little irregular. Mm -hmm. Although I have seen them uh, with complete fractures. Um, and typically they heal in about three weeks as compared to four to six weeks for mm -hmm. most fractures and we just modify the activity. And where are the most, I had it in my foot, but you can have them in your legs. It's more common on the weight-bearing joints, mm -hmm. so that they're more common in the feet and then also in the, uh, I've seen a lot of them in the uh, tibia and fibula, the, the bones in the lower leg. Okay, so do you see that more in people who participate in more high-impact activities like running? Exactly, um, I've seen quite a few in our cross-country athletes. Mm -hmm. I would imagine there's not probably a lot of 40 year old gymnasts out there, but gymnastics and that sort of stuff where it really pounds. Sure. Okay. Sure. Let's talk about one more. I had a friend who had a torn Achilles tendon, took mm -hmm. him out of running for quite a while. Um, what is there anything you can do to prevent that? Because that's, that's very uncomfortable when it happens. Those are disastrous injuries. Yeah. And um, frequently when you sustain one of those, you can actually hear it pop across the entire gymnasium. I've heard that, yeah. Yeah, and then the, uh, the muscle will ball up in the, in the back of the leg at the calf. Um, very, very painful injuries, very common injuries. Um, other than trying to stay uh, well conditioned, trying to stretch before you play, um, there are different schools of thought. Some I believe it's a result of poor blood flow to that area. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, but they are, are bad, bad injuries to have. Yeah, and that takes a while to, to recover from that, as I understand. It certainly does. You're typically looking at a six to 18 month recovery. Mm -hmm. And then oftentimes, even after that, people are never quite perfect and able to play yeah. at the same level. Are there certain sports, you know, that we, that we participate or activities we do as adults that seem to cause more injuries than others? I hate to say, oh, you know, like this one is worse for you than, you know, you know, running is worse than biking, but are there some that seem to cause more sports injuries than others, do you I think? I think, um, you know, football is always <laughs> one that's uh, somewhat fraught with injuries, but um, not to pick on one sport more so than the other. The problem is, is you have guys such as myself that are 50 or, or older, um, any of us over 40, and, and you think that you're still in shape and you think <laughs> that you can still do the things that you once did. And you may have a couple teenage sons and you may think you can still play with the boys. Uh -huh. And um, men sometimes have a difficult time slowing down. <laughs> That's what I was gonna ask. Do you think it's harder for people who were college athletes or high school athletes to sort of transition into that? You still wanna be active and athletic in your 40s and 50s, but you just can't go out and play basketball for three hours like you did when you were a kid. No, you sure, <laughs> it sure doesn't work that way. And you know, it, it's tough. Um, I attend the uh, father-son basketball camp every year with my two sons. And each year I say, this year is going to be different. <laughs> and each year I'm sore for at least two days mm -hmm. afterwards with the uh, delayed onset muscular soreness <laughs> we spoke about earlier. Uh -huh. um, it's, uh, it's hard to sometimes slow down when you were once able to do quite a mm -hmm. bit more. But there's still, I mean, I see people out who are far older than you or I that are still out running. I mean, you know, marathoners in their 80s, you know, clearly it, it doesn't mean that just when you hit a certain age, you're like done, can't do anything. 
That's right, and I love to see that. And my wife is almost 50 and still running marathons, mm -hmm. and I think that's phenomenal. I wish I could still do that. So why is it that someone like your wife can can run and you know still do that and not be plagued with injuries, yet other people, is it some, like running, is it for some people it's just their body architecture, I think the way they're built? I think it's largely genetics and um, whether or not you've had prior sports injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a college athlete in two different sports, yet can still run marathons, which yeah. is amazing to me. Well, let's talk about some of those former high school college athletes who sustained sports injuries, and now they're in their 40s and 50s. I would assume that some of that stuff starts to resurface in maybe sore joints. Do you, do you see more of that, like if you were injured as a, as a youth, that you may be more prone to it as an adult? Absolutely. Um, my father used to, to say... Uh, if I had known I'd lived this long, I would have taken better care of myself. <laughs> I've heard that before by, from several and, people. Um, and from what, what he says, I've seen that true in my own life. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of my former sports injuries, I'm, I'm starting to feel now that I'm over 50. Mm -hmm. So uh, Is, you can develop some degenerative, post-traumatic degenerative arthritis. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. Will some of those old injuries kind of res come back as arthritis? Yes. Okay. Yes. A lot of us after 40 start to develop some osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease is the newer term we call mm -hmm. it, uh, which is basically the wear and tear type arthritis with the aging process and life after 40. However, there's also post-traumatic arthritis that one can get from a prior sports injury. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, we, wanted, we were talking about this before we taped. We hear a lot about concussions, a lot of youth sustaining concussions now. What sort of things should parents be thinking about, you know, or even these, you know, young athletes, how will those concussions, is there possible side effects later down the road for them if they sustain more than three or four? Certainly. Uh, what we uh, worry most about with concussions is something called second impact syndrome. Mm -hmm. And in plain English, what that means is if you sustain two concussions within the same game, it could potentially be life-threatening. Mm -hmm. We see that more commonly in younger athletes for whatever reason as compared to older athletes. Um, here at Eastern, we're doing sophisticated computerized testing before season to screen each of our athletes to have a baseline. Mm -hmm. um, because frequently the interview uh, in getting a history from an athlete and the physical exam can't tell you everything you need to know. Mm -hmm. And that's been very helpful with, helpfully, uh, with uh, safely returning our athletes to play. So what are some of the things that you know, if you had several concussions as a youth, I mean, are you more likely, are you at higher risk for brain injuries, strokes, or don't we really know at this point? I don't think the answer is in yet. What we do know is after your first concussion, you're three to five times more likely to st sustain another concussion. Mm -hmm. And I see that all the time. The other thing I've learned is, is frequently, even though you might be more prone to having a second concussion, most patients tend to bounce back more qu quickly mm -hmm. uh, with their second or third concussion. There's really no scientific uh, research that tells us how many concussions it's safe <laughs> to sustain before it's unsafe for someone to return to play mm -hmm. uh, at this time. So we basically uh, do everything we can with what we know mm -hmm. and use all the uh, information available to us. And, Okay. Well, hopefully we can get by, get our, you know, kids through without having, you know, concussions and injuries like that. Yes. Um, let's just backtrack a little bit. So you you went out and ran a, you know, three miles and the next day you're a little sore. How do you know that mm, I need to see my doctor? When is soreness or pain really some, an indication that maybe there's something else that might require medical attention? You know, if you have a massive amount of swelling, if you're unable to bear weight upon the affected uh, body part, um, those are red flags. Um, another thing I see from time to time in our athletes is rhabdomyolysis, where basically the, the muscle breaks down, mm -hmm. and, and that's quite severe and can even cause renal failure and we've had uh, students hospitalized for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the big cue for that is you'll have brown urine. Oh, okay. Okay. And that you've got to do something pretty significant to get to that level? Yes. Okay. Yes, those are primarily your elite college athletes. Okay. Um, although I've read about it in high school athletes mm -hmm. as so well. So probably not 
people like you and me. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> so if you have a typical muscle strain, how long does that take to kind of get over that? If you, you know, do the things that we've talked about, is it maybe, you know, a couple of days, a week? You know, uh, this uh, delayed onset muscular soreness usually lasts two, three days. Mm -hmm. um, if you, as far as being really severe, but oftentimes it, it takes a week or two before you're back to perfect, mm -hmm. back to 100%. And say with a lumbar strain, the interesting thing is, is younger people tend to um, get well much more quickly than, than <laughs> older, and you've probably noticed that, I know I have, uh -huh. uh, that uh, that the body just doesn't heal as quickly as it once no. did. So what <laughs> what may have taken me ten year, uh, two weeks when I was was 10 or 12 years old now takes me, you know, four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. I know, you talked about lumbar, and that's a whole area we didn't talk about, which was back injuries. Mm -hmm. Very common. Uh, what sort of things can we do to sort of prevent a low, lower back pain and injuries? Uh, you know, work on our, our, our core strength, mm -hmm. um, the abdominal core musculature, uh, try to remain as flexible as possible, uh, proper diet, exercise. Again, a lot of what I see is a result of uh, the vast majority of us being overweight and out of shape and trying to do too much too fast. Mm -hmm. uh, well, as we wrap up here, let's talk about some prevention measures. You already talked about maintaining your flexibility not doing, you know, not, if you haven't worked out for a while, it's probably not a good idea to just run right out your door and start sprinting. What are some other recommendations uh, for prevention of sports injuries can you give us? Um, <laughs> in addition to proper diet and, and starting slowly, and they usually recommend a 10% rule where you keep adding 10% mm -hmm. per week. Mm -hmm. um, usually I've found personally the first uh, two weeks are pretty miserable and uh, <laughs> it takes four to six weeks before I actually start to enjoy exercise mm -hmm. again and if you've been disabled uh, uh, from an injury that can take even longer because mm -hmm. um, when you become deconditioned you t typically gain weight and and you can get so out of shape mm -hmm. it's just hard to find the motivation to even start yeah and was, you know proper shoes you know if you haven't worked out in a sure. while you, it's probably not a good idea to grab those shoes that have been in the closet for the last 10 years exactly uh, proper shoes and proper hydration especially in the summer as it gets hot well Absolutely. hydration all the time but anytime it's uh, the temperature gets up there yes all right. Well, we're all out of time, Dr. Garner. Thank you for so much for coming on, taking oh, care of our, my pleasure. our EIU athletes and taking care of us weekend warrior athletes as well. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. We all know exercise has its many benefits, but according to the findings of a new study, it can also help ward off cancer and boost survival rates if you're diagnosed. Researchers from the University of Vermont studied more than 17,000 men for close to 20 years. They found those who exercised the most were 68% less likely to develop lung cancer and 38% less likely to develop colorectal cancers than the less active men. Among those men who did develop either of those two cancers or prostate cancer, Exercise helped reduce the risk of death by 14% for each incremental increase in fitness level. Scientists at Oregon Health and Science University have successfully reprogrammed the human skin cells to become embryonic stem cells capable of transforming into any other cell type in the body. The technique involves transplanting the nucleus of one cell containing an individual's DNA into an egg cell that has had its genetic material removed. The unfertilized egg cell then develops and eventually produces stem cells. The breakthrough could lead to the development of replacement tissue to treat diseases. Another noteworthy aspect of this research is that it does not involve the use of fertilized embryos. Would you believe one in a hundred emergency room visits is because of a dog or cat bite? Wounds and cuts to the skin in general are among the top reasons people head to the hospital. Here's Dennis Dota for the Mayo Clinic News Network. This is Binks, or Mr. Binks as we call him. He's the guilty party. Dawn Bothan loves her pets, Binks the cat and a four pound Pomeranian named Cooper, who seem pretty fond of each other because Binks tries to play bodyguard anytime visiting dogs get too rough with Cooper. The other dog was just on top of him playing with him and he was squeaking. 
So the cat got worried for the dog. I had my hand down there and the cat just struck. The resulting wound looked like a vampire bite. Dawn says although it really hurt, she thought, oh well. It'll heal. No big deal. One week later, the redness and swelling finally concerned her enough to see a doctor, who immediately sent her to the emergency department. What followed was a hospital stay, IV antibiotics, and a very close call. I had seven surgeries in that following two weeks while I was in the hospital. It was scary. I, was cr I cried every night before surgery. Every night, because I, I had it in my head I was going to wake up at coming out of surgery with no arm. The cat bite is the worst. Dr. Annie Sadasti is the chair of Mayo Clinic's Department of Emergency Medicine. By virtue of the puncture, the bacteria closed in and it's hard to wash out no matter what we do. That's why Dr. Sadasti says we should always seek care for animal bites. Wounds to hands and joints or those with significant bleeding, numbness or loss of function also need attention. For small cuts, the doctor says we can simply rinse them well with tap water and apply a triple antibiotic ointment. Antiseptics like alcohol or hydrogen peroxide are not recommended. Some of those are extremely painful on an open wound um, and you can actually damage some of the tissue through that. If, after your best efforts, a skin injury shows increasing redness, swelling or oozing, see a doctor. But in general, the message is sooner rather than later. Protecting Cooper from the great big nasty four-month-old pit bull. It's a lesson Dawn says she learned the hard way. For the Mayo Clinic News Network, I'm Dennis Doda. Thanks for watching this episode of Being Well. Join us online anytime at youtube.com slash weiutv. Here you can view current as well as past episodes. We'll see you next time.